Hi, I'm BP and this is my attempt at a Pokemon Black 2 Challenge Mode Hardcore Nuzlocke using only shiny Pokemon. In Generation 5, the shiny odds are 1 in 8192, making these beautiful critters quite rare, and I'll be putting their lives on the line for glory and for your entertainment. For the full list of Nuzlocke rules, check the description below, and let's start hunting. Unlike modern Pokemon games, we can actually shiny hunt the starters, and I decide to hunt Tepig for three reasons. One, it has the best boss battle matchups amongst the starters. Two, it's probably the best looking shiny in my opinion. And three, I don't have to select it, meaning all I have to do is press A, which saves a lot more time than you would think. And eventually it all pays off. Shiny Tepig, Shiny Tepig, yes, all right. Oh my God, finally, whew. After 8,558 soft resets, we finally find King the Shiny Tepig, and he quickly proves to be the ruler of the Crit Kingdom, as we win not only the first rival battle with the Crit Tackle, but the second one as well. Finally, a useful monarch. And even though King is an absolute gamer, Charon is a really tough gym for just one Pokemon, so I decide to hunt for one more Pokemon in the Felicity Ranch, and I was hoping for a Shiny Mareep, but well, Let's just say I get one better. Holy <laughs> Oh my God. That's a shiny Rylu. Oh my God. I'm shook. The reason I'm so stunned is because Rylu only has a 5% spawn rate, making this an extremely lucky find. And with Oreo on the team, Charon will be no problem at all. Charon starts with Patrat as I start with Oreo. He lands a chunky tackle, but we send it right back with a counter, doing over 50%. He lands another tackle, proccing our Orenberry and his death as another counter takes him out. And with that XP, we level up to level 15, learning Force Palm, which one-shots Charon's ace, Lillipop. Next is his challenge mode member Pidove, but it doesn't have any flying moves, so we safely take it out with two more Force Palms, earning us our first badge. Before we head off to Roxy, I decide to hunt for another Pokemon, and we get pretty lucky as it only takes us around 4,000 encounters to find our next shiny. Yo, let's go, dude. Alrighty, shiny Magnemite. Hey, this should make uh, Roxy pretty easy. We name our Magnemite Cube because, well, he isn't a cube. And while in the base games, Magnemite is just a free win versus Roxy, in challenge mode, she has a Grimer with Mud Slap, which, excuse the pun, slaps around Magnemite due to it being four times super effective and lowering our accuracy. But it is still a great Pokemon. I just wanted to mention that it's not as free as in the base games. All right, King also evolves, and with that, it's time to take on Roxy. Roxy starts with Coughing as we lead with Cube. We land a soft magnet bomb, but coughing lands an even softer tackle. And with the magnet bomb chip, two sonic booms finish off the coughing. Roxy brings in Grimer as I switch into Oreo to tank the mud slap, and I mistakenly try to set up some work ups. We only get to plus two though before taking too much damage and we're forced to attack. Oreo lands a plus two quick attack, which does very underwhelming damage. Grimer then lands another Venoshock, and I'm really stupid because I risk getting crit by this Venoshock, for a quick attack that doesn't even land thanks to the Mud Slap accuracy drop. The Venoshock then brings Oreo down to just 4 HP, so we were definitely dead to a crit there. So looking back, I really don't know what I was thinking. I bring in King who tanks a soft Venoshock and then I land a decently hard Flame Charge, boosting our speed. But then Grimer disables my Flame Charge, forcing me to use the much worse tackle, and after a potion, it takes us a while, but we eventually do take it out, and just in time for Flame Charge to no longer be disabled, which is perfect for her next Pokemon Whirlipede. We land a Flame Charge, which brings her down to 50% HP, but thanks to the Citrus Berry, we won't be able to take it down in the next turn, as she lands a pretty rough Venoshock. I then risk the crit again, by going for another Flame Charge, which brings her into the red, but activates her Poison Point, which poisons King, and in turn boosts Venoshock's power, which will definitely take King out. Or it would if I didn't give King a Petra Berry, curing the poison and allowing us to live a Venoshock with 10 HP as we finish off Whirlipede with one last Flame Charge. 
Honestly, looking back, I'm not proud of how I played this battle since it was much safer to bring in Cube vs Wellipede, since it can't really touch us and then we can just slowly take it out, but I guess this is better for content. After becoming a Pokestar, we evolve Oreo into the beautiful Lucario and then head straight to Berg. He starts with Dwebble as I start with Cube, and Cube lands a Thunder Wave because, well, I just felt like being a bit cheeky. It does end up being useful as Dwebble tries to set up a Rock Polish, but Thunder Wave makes it pretty useless. We then miss a Mirror Shot as Dwebble sets up a Rock Polish. We land the second Mirror Shot, which brings Dwebble down to its Sturdy and procs its Citrus Berry but it just sets up another rock polish, and even at plus 6, we still outspeed thanks to the thunder wave. And one last thunder shock finishes off the little crab. Berg brings in his Carablast, so I bring in King, who eats a soft headbutt on the switch. King then lands a flame charge, which is enough to one-shot Carablast, and thanks to the speed boost, we outspeed his ace Levani, and also one-shot it with a flame charge, leaving his Shelmet, but it just falls to a flame charge, making this an easy battle. I'm feeling a lot less confident about Elisa, so I was going to hunt for two shiny Pokemon. But, well, after 1600 encounters, we finally find a shiny. Oh! <laughs> yes, let's go! Finally, man! Holy! T like, over two times the odds, man. Oh my god. <laughs> But finally, we got ourselves a sand dial. All right. Dude, I was going to do two hunts, but I don't know if I can now. That was insane. At this point, I was pretty tired of hunting, so after evolving Steve, I head straight to Elisa. I lead with Cube as Elisa starts with the Molga, who lands a weak pursuit as Cube hits a Sonic Boom. A Molga hits another pursuit as I land a Thundershock, which procs a Molga's Citrus Berry. I then get completely outplayed as she switches into Zeb Striker, who gains a speed boost from our Thundershock with his motor drive ability. She then predicts me again as she lands a boosted pursuit as I switch Cube out, but I'm glad she did this as it's a safe switch into Steve. Zeb Striker then hits a stomp, which of course gets the flinch. It should be fine as long as the next stomp doesn't also flinch. Whew. Thankfully it doesn't and Steve is able to get a dig off, which one shots her Zeb Striker. Man, that could have been really bad if she got a second flinch. Elisa then brings in her Joltik, so I switch to King on an X-Scissor. King then outspeeds and one-shots the Joltik with a Heat Crash. She brings in her Amolga, and I switch back out into Cube to eat the Aerial Ace. I decide to paralyze the rat with a T-Wave as it lands a Soft Pursuit. I then bring in King, who now outspeeds and finishes off the Amolga with a Heat Crash. Last is her Flaffy, who just barely survives a Heat Crash as it paralyzes King. Thankfully though, we get a higher roll on the second Heat Crash and dodge the Paralysis, which one-shots Flaffy after a Hyper Potion, earning us our fourth badge. Honestly, our team is looking extremely weak to Clay, with Steve being the only one not weak to Ground-type moves. So, I think it's time to start hunting again. And I was looking for a dealing, but we end up finding a pretty cool Pokemon. Dude, shiny barrel. Okay, that's, that is insanely lucky. Not only is it a short hunt, other than the sand dial one, but I think barrels are really like, really low chance. I've mainly been running into dealings. Um, the only thing I'm worried about is, did I buy Pokeballs? Okay, good. Netball is water type? Okay, let's just throw a netball and try our best here. Holy, no, okay, well, uh, I'll be cared, but it failed. Uh, I don't think assurance would kill. That'd be kind of insane. Oh, no, Meryl. Why do you have, why do you have double edge? Oh no, uh, 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 be, uh, ultra ball. <laughs> no, that's double edge. No shot. Okay, aqua rings, that's good. At least it's gonna be healing itself up. Great ball. All right, there we go. Sweet, that was scary. We name our Meryl Terry, and thankfully it has huge power, which doubles its physical attack, making it a pretty strong Pokemon. And then while grinding to the level cap, Cube, Terry, and King all evolve into their final forms, giving us a huge boost in power before probably the scariest fight yet. And with our new adults, it's time to jump right into Clay. Clay leads with Crookerock, who intimidates our lead Oreo, but thanks to a fighting gem boost, our Force Palm takes him out. 
This brings in his Onyx and we land a Force Palm, but it doesn't even bring it down to yellow due to the Intimidate as it sets up a Rock Polish. Onyx then lands a Rock Slide as our Force Palm leaves Onyx in the red. I know Clay will heal here, so I go for a workup as Clay does use a Hyper Potion. Onyx lands another Rock Slide as our Force Palm is now a clean 2 hit KO. But then Onyx explodes, which does little damage due to our Steel Typing and Onyx's piss poor attack stat. Clay brings in Sand Slash, so I send in Cube on the Bulldoze, which might seem like the biggest throw of the century, but Cube is holding an Air Balloon, which allows us to avoid ground type moves, giving us a free switch. Cube then hits a hard mirror shot as Sand Slash sets up the Home Claws. This is huge as Cube gets to keep his Air Balloon, and as long as he doesn't miss Mirror Shot... Awesome. This brings in his last Pokemon Excadrill. And I'm pretty safe to switch into Steve since Excadrill won't go for Bulldoze in front of the Balloon. Steve does take more damage than I thought from a Rock Slide considering he resists it and he's holding the Eviolite, but we outspeed the next turn and go for a dig. Which barely misses the KO as Excadrill eats a Citrus Berry and then lands a nasty Bulldoze. I know he'll go for Bulldoze again so I bring in Cube and then pivot straight to Terry who tanks a Rock Slide. Excadrill then hits a slash, but we luckily don't get crit, and we don't miss an Aqua Tail, allowing Terry to finish off Excadrill and earn our fifth badge. Honestly, if Sand Slash didn't go for that Home Claws, we probably would have lost a couple of Pokemon in this battle. So, thanks, Sand Slash. While on the way to the next gym, Steve evolves into Krugadal, and then we head straight to Skylar and her flying type Pokemon. Skylar starts with Swoobat, who outspeeds and lands a Psychic on Cube who retaliates with an Electro Ball, but it barely misses the KO. I know Skylar is going to heal here, so I go for a Thunder Wave, paralyzing the Swoobat, which lowers its speed, and in turn boosts Electro Ball's power, allowing us to one-shot it next turn. Next is our Water Turkey Swarner, who lands a pretty hard Surf before getting knocked out by a 4 times super effective Electro Ball. Sigalith is up next, but it misses a Hypnosis as Volt Switch one-shots it. I bring in King as she sends out Skarmory, and I thought it might outspeed so I go for a Flame Charge, which does just over 50%, but then she goes for an Agility, allowing her to outpace me. Skarmory now outspeeds and lands an Aerial Ace, which doesn't even look like a 2 hit KO, as King hits a heavy Heat Crash, winning us the 6th badge. After beating Skylar, we head to Reversal Mountain, where we have to escort Bianca, and this is great for shiny hunting because she makes every battle a double battle, which tends to speed up the process. Well, tends to, it doesn't always, as it still takes us over 9000 encounters, but we do eventually find our next shiny. Oh! Yo, let's go! Shardy Woobat, oh my god. I was kind of hoping for a Shardy like Spoik, but that's awesome. Oh my god. Alright, um, so we're going to kill Bashada first. Okay, hopefully that one shots. Yep, awesome. Oh my god, that's sick. Alright. Oh, she has like a full team, bro. Uh. Uh. Does Crunch take it out? I feel like Foul Play is going to do more damage, right? Come on, no, bitch out. No, stop. Okay, I'm just gonna switch that out. I'm gonna have to kill our whole team, bro. I mean, that's fine, because you killed the th that, right? Okay, um. No, yes. Is this a good idea? I'm doing it. I'm masterballing it. Because <laughs> I, I don't want to kill it. Oh my god. Since we used a Master Ball, I name Woobat Master and he joins the team. And after some running around, it evolves into a Swoobat, and looking at our team and thinking back on how long it took me to find them all, I can't help but smile. They're all so cool and I can't imagine any other team taking this challenge on with me, and I really hope they all make it to the Elite Four. Yeah, we lose Terry to this random triple battle in the 7th gym. The sad thing is, Fracture lived on like 1 HP from the previous turn, but even worse is I didn't even need to battle this guy since I already did the rotation battle on the other side, so this was an absolutely pointless death. Nonetheless though, Terry did die, so we head over to the PC and release Terry back into the cruel wild lands from once he came. Losing Terry was super sad, but Oreo with his raging ice fists is ready to avenge Terry by beating down Drayden and his dragon type Pokemon. 
He leads with Drudigan as we start with Oreo who sets up a sword stance as Drudigan hits a very soft rock slide. And with plus two attack, Oreo's ice punch one shot to Drudigan, Altaria, Flygon, and Haxorus, avenging Terry and earning us the seventh badge. And as much as I hate to do it, we have to replace Terry, so using Golduck, we start hunting again, and after 11,000 encounters, we find our next shiny. Hell yeah, dude, shiny frillish. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, 11,000 encounters. Man, Terry just lived. We wouldn't have to do this stuff, but that's pretty sick. Alrighty. Um... I'm really high level. Does Ice Punch just kill? Surely not. Oh! Okay. Uh, Grimple? Alright, easy. We name our Frillish Pringles and then evolve it into Jellicent. And once we get all the Plasma Jazz out of the way, it's a straight shot to Marlin and his water types. Marlin leads with Whale Lord, who falls to a single Expert Belt Boosted Discharge from Cube, and this brings in his Caracosta, who can be an insanely scary Pokemon, thanks to its Shell Smash Sturdy combo. But Discharge does proc it Sturdy and its Berry, as it just goes for a Scold, which does decent chip to Cube, but we're able to finish it off the next turn with one more Discharge. This brings out his Mantine, who just falls to a 4 times super effective Discharge. Now it's his Ace Jellicent who actually tanks a Discharge and fires back with a Steaming Scold. But, one more Discharge finishes off the battle, earning us a easy last badge. With the Gym Challenge out of the way, it's time to put an end to Getsis. First he tries to take us out with Kieran Black, but Oreo just one-shots it with a Fighting Gem boost to close combat, bringing the tortured Pokemon. Getsis then being the charming fellow he is, attacks us right after, but his lead Cophagigas can't really touch Oreo, as we freely set up a sword stance as it tries to use Protect. It's pretty safe here to just set up a second sword stance, getting Oreo up to plus 4 while only taking a fairly soft Psychic. And with these attack boosts, Oreo's Shadow Claw gets a clean KO onto Cophagigas. Next is his Seismitoad, but it also can't take a hit from Oreo as Close Combat knocks it out. He then brings in Drapion, but thanks to its Dark Typing, Close Combat does neutral damage, allowing us to take it out as well. Getsis then brings in his Electros, but with its 50 base speed, we easily outpace it and finish it off with yet another Close Combat. He then brings in Toxicroak, and I was a little bit spooked that it had Sucker Punch, since we're now at minus 4 defense thanks to the Close Combat drops, but after a quick Google search, I know it's safe to just take it out with the Shadow Claw. And last up is his Hydreigon, who Oreo outspeeds and one-shots with a super effective close combat. And man, Oreo has been cleaning up this endgame for us. Speaking of the late game, we are one step away from the Elite Four, but in the way is probably one of the hardest victory roads I've experienced. I'm not going to show all of the battles I had issue with, but I'll show this battle versus Veteran Portia, who leads with Zeb Striker, and since I can't bolt switch, I had to hard switch into King, who gets hit by a soft flame charge. Zeb Striker then outspeeds and hits a Discharge, which gets the Paralysis on King, who then gets fully paralysed. Zeb Striker then lands a Crit Discharge, bringing King into the red, as he Crash doesn't KO. King will most definitely die this next turn, so I bring in Steve, who I was trying not to use in fear of overleveling him, but he easily shakes off a Discharge, and then finishes off the Zeb Striker with a Crunch. Portia then brings in Starmie, so I bring Q back in, who gets hit by an extremely hard Surf. We are able to tank a second one though with 40 HP as we one shot Starmie with the Discharge. This then brings in a Sork and this is where I do the very big stupid. As instead of hard switching I try to break Sork sturdy with a Bolt Switch, but it outspeeds Cube and kills it with a Brick Break. This was a really dumb way to lose one of our best Pokemon and it just goes to show how easy it is to lose a Pokemon when you're trying to rush through the battles. I then bring in Master who brings Sork to its sturdy with the Psychic but Sork retaliates with a hard rock tomb, which would have killed if it crit, but due to the speed drop, I have to switch into Pringles, who finishes the battle with the Surf. I don't know why I just didn't bring in Pringles from the start, as it would have saved us a lot of stress, but it happens, so we've just got to move on. The misplays keep coming though, as I accidentally triggered the last rival battle while leading with Master, and honestly, this battle is really tough without Cube, 
as he leads with Unpheasant, and I thought it couldn't really touch Master as I set up a cold mine, but it lands a Swagger, confusing us. I decide to stay in though and try to set up a second coal mine. Luckily we don't hit ourselves in confusion so we set up the plus 2 special attack and special defense. But Unpheasant lands a pretty powerful facade, bringing Master into the yellow. I risk another confusion hit as I try to hit a psychic. Thankfully Master breaks through and ends up taking out the Unpheasant. Next is his starter Samurott and Master once again breaks through the confusion, landing a psychic and one shotting the... No way. No way. Yeah, Samurott lived on a sliver of HP and then crit surfed to take out Master. This is really rough, but I bring in Oreo who sets up a sword stance as our rival uses a full restore. And at plus two, close combat is enough to take out the water rat. Next is his Buffalant, but Oreo easily takes it out with a super effective close combat. Last is his Simus Age, and to make sure we don't get outsped in one shot, I bring in King. But King isn't full HP because again, I wasn't ready for this battle, as Brick Break brings us into the yellow. I risk getting crit by Brick Break here, as I go for Heat Crash, and thankfully, he doesn't get the crit, allowing King to one-shot it with the Heat Crash, winning us the last rival battle. Honestly, we could have played this battle better, firstly not leading with Swoobat and not risking that many crits. We do eventually make it to the Pokemon League, but for a place called Victory Road, we sure did sustain some losses. And I don't really want to go into the Elite Four with only four Pokemon, so I decide to go hunting again. And now I know I want a Psychic type, so I hunt in the Giant Chasm as it has three Psychic type encounters available, giving us a good shot at finding at least one Psychic Shiny. And after about 6,000 encounters, we find our next Shiny. Yo! <laughs> Let's go! Shiny the tag. Oh my, okay. I, this is great and all, but this might be the hardest Pokemon in existence to catch. Let's try. Alrighty. <laughs> um, it did raise its defense, so it could probably, oh my god. It takes us a while, but after about eight minutes, we catch Mustang the Shiny Matang. Oh! Okay, oh my god. Dude, that was terrifying. I thought it was gonna goddamn hit itself and struggle. Alright. I then thought a shiny skill link Chinchino would be really fun to use, but after 10,000 soft resets, I looked up whether you can even get this Minchino shiny, and it turns out you can't. So I wasted an ungodly amount of time trying to hunt for a shiny that couldn't be shiny. This hurt. Like, a lot. But I was so close to finishing the run, so I just headed back to Victory Road and started hunting, and after another 10,000 encounters, we find Gertia. Yes! Finally did, Shiny Gertia. Alright. We can't evolve Murphy, but that's okay since with the Eviolite, it's actually a pretty bulky Pokemon. Though it does have sheer force as opposed to the much better guts and a minus attack nature, which kinda stinks. I then EV train my new friends, which causes Mustang to evolve into Metagross, who has one of the best shinies. I mean, look at him. He's just gorgeous. And now, with everyone at the level cap, we head in to take on the Elite Four. This is our final team at the level cap, and it's time to head into the Elite Four. I decide to start with Caitlyn, as she is by far the easiest Elite Four member, since Moxie Crocodile kind of just runs through her whole team. Caitlyn starts with Mushana, and I wasn't too sure if Crunch would one-shot, and I don't have a Chesto Berry, so it could be a bit awkward if we get hit by Hypnosis. But I risk it and go for a Crunch, as she actually switches out Mushana for Renunaglis, which comes into a Crunch, one-shotting it. This gives Steve a plus one thanks to his Moxie ability. Next is our Life Orb Metagross, who can really hit hard, but Steve outspeeds and one-shots it with a plus one Earthquake. And from here, it's a clean sweep, as Crunch one-shots Sigilyph, Gothitelle, and Mushana, who kicked off this massacre. Well, that was an easy first battle, and now it's time for take on Chantel. Chantel starts with Cofragigas, and Steve with a Dark Gem boosted crunch one-shots it. But we don't get a Moxie boost due to Cofragigas' ability Mummy, which, when you make contact, replaces your ability with Mummy. Chantel brings in Chandelure, which in challenge mode has a Choice Scarf, and it should either go for a Fire Blast or an Energy Ball here, so I switch into King who resists both. 
so King comes in on a Fire Blast, which actually does a good chunk of damage. And now I do the Big Dumb. Instead of getting a free switch into Pringle, I stay in with King and go for a Head Smash. So Chandelure hits a Fire Blast, which we live, but then we hit the Head Smash. <sighs> this was a super dumb death, and it's sad to lose our very first Shiny of the run to my small brain, but on the plus side, this gives us a free switch into Steve, as Chantel brings out Drift Blim. Steve then outspeeds and hits a crit crunch, one-shotting the Drift Blim and giving us a Moxie boost. Golek comes in next, but all it does is give Steve another plus one, as Crunch one-shots it. And Bayonet also can't take the draw pressure of our Crocodile, as it falls through a crunch, winning us our second Elite Four match, but not without a heavy loss. King, you were the best of us all, and you will be missed. Next is Grimsley, who starts with Liopard as we start with Oreo. Liopard lands a normal gem boosted fake out, but thanks to Oreo's inner focus ability, we don't get blinched and freely set up a sword stance. Liopard then outspeeds and attracts Oreo, which can cause some problems, as Oreo is far too starstruck to hit Liopard with a close combat. This then allows Liopard to land an aerial ace, which brings Oreo down to just above 50% HP, but we break through the attract this turn, landing a close combat and taking out the Liopard. Crocodile comes in next, and thanks to its Intimidate, Oreo is down to just plus one attack, but plus one is all we need to take it out with a close combat. I mean, we did crit, but let's just believe in Oreo's power and say he didn't need it. Next is Scrafty, who also falls to a close combat. Then she brings in Absol, who looks cooler than he actually is, as we outspeed and one-shot it with another close combat. Last up is Bishop, but after checking to see if it has Sucker Punch, we click Close Combat, and with it being 4 times super effective, there was no way we didn't one-shot Bishop there, and that's Grimsley defeated, which brings us to our worst nightmare. Marshall worries me greatly since his team is by far the most threatening out of all the Elite Four members, and in Challenge Mode, this threat is only elevated since his Conkledur is now holding a Flame Orb, as opposed to his normal Citrus Berry. This guarantees Conkledur gaining Burnt, and thanks to its Guts ability, this gives it an attack boost. It also has Earthquake, which rips through my team, so I'm pretty worried, but hopefully we can pull it together and beat our last challenge before the champion. Marshall starts off with a Muppet King throw, as we start with Mustang. I set up a Home Clause as Thor hits a weak Rock Tomb, but thanks to our Clear Body ability, it doesn't get a Speed Drop. I set up another Home Clause as Thor hits a Soft Payback. And now at plus 2, Mustang hits a Zen Headbutt, taking out Throw. Marshall then brings in his scariest Pokemon Conkelda, and I once again do the big stupid, and instead of just pressing a plus 2 Zen Headbutt, I switch into Pringle. I think I was just really scared of Conkelda living and landing an Earthquake, but I'm immediately punished for this passive play, as Conkelda uses Bulk Up, boosting its attack and defense by 1, while getting burnt by Flame Orb, boosting its attack even further with Guts. So now I'm in trouble. I stay in with Pringles and land a Shadow Ball for Chip as Conkledo gets greedy and sets up another bulk up. We land another Shadow Ball, but it barely misses the KO as Conkledo misses the Stone Edge, and thanks to the Shadow Balls, the burn takes him out. So, never mind, we're never punished. But that could have been really bad if Marshall wasn't as bad at the game as I am. Next is his Lucario, so I switch into Murphy for his first battle as Lucario sets up a Coal Mine on the Switch. So, I'm once again in danger. And I forgot to give Murphy Drain Punch, so we have to rely on the infamously inaccurate Dynamic Punch. Lucario sets up another Coal Mind, and Murphy, the absolute legend, against all odds, lands a Dynamic Punch, wrecking the Lucario. Next is Menshao, who goes for a bounce as we miss Scary Face. I switch into Pringle to tank the bounce on the switch, and it does a huge amount of damage thanks to a critical hit, but we're still above half HP. I go for a Will-O-Wisp, but Menshao springs into the air, avoiding the attack. So we just go for another Wisp as Menshao comes down. Now Menshao is burned and has halved attack, making it pretty useless. I then freely bring in Mustang, as Menshao springs up into the air again with Bounce. Mustang does get hit by the Bounce and it sadly gets paralyzed, but Mustang breaks through this turn as Zen Headbutt finishes off the Menshao. Next is Sork, who outspeeds and lands a decent Brick Break as Mustang gets fully paralyzed. I don't want to risk a crit, so I bring in Pringle, who phases through the Brick Break. Sork then lands a crit payback, bringing Pringles to 42 HP, 
but Cursed Body activates, disabling Sork's payback as we land a Will-O-Wisp halving its attack and breaking it sturdy. After neutering Sork, we bring in Murphy back as Sork lands a pathetic Rock Slide. Sork then hits a harder Brick Break, but Murphy once again hits a Dynamic Punch, which barely misses the KO, but brings Sork into the range of burn damage, which takes it out, winning us our last Elite Four battle. Honestly, we could have just swept with Mustang, but I think this makes for a more dramatic and entertaining martial fight, so I hope you enjoyed it. But now it's time for our final challenge. Iris starts with Hydreigon as we start with the Wonderboy Murphy, who eats a Dragon Pulse like a protein bar, but then he misses his Dynamic Punch, meaning we have to risk a crit next turn. Thankfully though, Dragon Pulse doesn't crit, and Murphy lands a Dynamic Punch one-shotting Iris's Hydreigon. Next is her Drudigan, so I switch Murphy out into Pringle, who gets absolutely thrashed by a Life Orb Outrage. Thankfully though, Curse Body activates, disabling Outrage, but since it's still locked in, we get a free turn as I land a Will-O-Wisp, halving Drudigan's attack as it gets confused from Outrage being disabled. I then bring in Steve as Drudigan hits itself in confusion. I then set up a home clause with Steve, boosting his attack by 1, as Drudigan hits a super hard Focus Blast. I legit had a team open on my second monitor, so I don't know why I didn't see Focus Blast. This brings Steve down to just 59 HP, meaning if it either crit or we got hit by that first move, we could have lost Steve here, which is super scary. But Steve hangs on and finishes Drudigan off with a crunch. Iris then brings out her Lapras, but a plus 2 ground gem boosted Earthquake takes it out. Now it's her Haxorus, who lives in Earthquake thanks to its Focus Sash and retaliates with x ending Steve's Reign of Terror. I then bring in Oreo the Dragon Slayer, who hits a hard Ice Punch as Iris heals. We don't take it out, but on the next turn another Ice Punch finishes Haxorus off. Next is our Agron, and I don't want to risk Oreo, so I switch into Murphy to tank the Earthquake. This is so we can freely switch into Pringle, but Murphy lives, as I try to hit a Dynamic Punch, but sadly Agron outspeeds and hits a Double Edge, finishing Murphy off. You weren't with us for long Murphy, but you put in a lot of work, so thanks buddy. I can now bring in Pringle for free, who one shots Agron with Scold. Last is her Archaeops, who outspeeds Pringle and lands a hard Stone Edge, bringing Pringle into the red. We then retaliate with a Scold, one shotting her Archaeops and earning our spot as Universe Champion. That was my attempt at a Pokemon Black 2 Challenge Mode Hardcore Nuzlocke using only shiny Pokemon. This run took me just about 4 months to complete, so I hope you enjoyed as I definitely had fun, but I think I'll be going back to boosted odds for my future shiny videos. Next video will be a Pokemon Heart Gold Nuzlocke using only water types, so if that sounds exciting, make sure you're subscribed and have notifications on. But while you wait for that, might I suggest one of these videos on screen. And with that, I hope you're all staying safe and have a lovely day.